This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. Good morning. Welcome to Livermore and the Bankhead Theater and to the second of four Science on Saturday presentations. Local educators in conjunction with the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory produce these series so you can learn science from those who are making history through its use. This year we are broadcasting this, live, uh, the, this event live online by visiting the Livermore Lab's Facebook page or watch it on your mobile device by visiting livestream.com backslash LLNL. Questions can be posed to the presenters with a chat box below the video player, or you can tweet your questions by including the Science on Saturday hashtag. Our lecture today is Sleuthing Seismic Signals, Understanding Earthquake Hazard and Monitoring Nuclear Explosions. Who here has been in an earthquake? Raise your hand. Wow. The last quake in this region with major destructive power was in 1989. Today's lecture will inform you on how scientists read an earthquake and differentiate an earthquake and a nuclear test. Ken Waddell and Dr. Sean Ford are the presenters today. Ken is a, teaches earth sciences, earth sciences and English, earth science for English language learners at Tracy High School. Ken also works with action learning systems creating California earth science standards based on benchmark tests. He has his science degree in geology from California State University, Stanislaus. Who's here from Foothill? Anybody from Foothill? <laughs> Go Falconers. Dr. Sean Ford is from Foothill High School. He's a seismologist on the, in the ground-based nuclear detonation detection program, which is part of the physical and life science directorate at Livermore National Laboratories. His primary research involves understanding the seismic signature of the explosion source. He co-authored a paper titled, and you'll be tested on this, Seismic Antunation, Event Discrimination, Magnitude and Yield Estimation, and Capability Analysis. That's just the title. Dr. Ford is a local, attended Foothill High School in Pleasanton, received his PhD in Earth and Planetary Science from the University of California. Please welcome Dr. Ford and Ken Weddell. All right, well, uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Sean, and this is Ken. And today we're going to talk about earthquakes and explosions. So here are the questions that we hope to answer today. One, what will the next earthquake be like? Um, why will there be another large earthquake? Um, when can we expect that large earthquake? And then finally, uh, how is an earthquake like an explosion? And how do scientists at the Livermore Lab use that information to detect explosions around the world? So this, I'm going to start to show a movie here. On the left panel, is the, in red, is the Hayward Fault. The yellow dot is Livermore, where we are now. So it's that sort of a map view looking down. The right panel is sort of a bird's eye view above Livermore, looking into, uh, you know, across the, into the bay, into the Hayward Fault in the distance. You can see where I work, LLNL, Livermore Lab, in blue. And you can see where we are right now, uh, downtown Bankhead, uh, in purple. So the earthquake starts now and initiates at the red dot to your left. This movie is one scenario that scientists at the US Geological Survey predict may happen in the next magnitude 7 Hayward earthquake. The colors represent the level of ground shaking, and we can see the ground movement in the right panel. 
The P wave, represented by the light purple intensity, arrives first. We'll talk more about the P wave later. The earthquake zips down the fault, heading south from San Pablo Bay, down through Oakland, into Hayward and Fremont. The strong shaking in red heads towards us at about 3,600 miles an hour. The ground movement in this movie is magnified a thousand times, but the intensity values, the color, is not. After about a minute, much of the East Bay, including Livermore, is covered in red. But whenever you see a scientific movie or figure like this, you have to ask yourself, what do the colors mean? Well, we have a legend up in the top right, shaking intensity, and we can see that this red e equates to shaking intensity nine. Uh, that is to say that this magnitude seven on the Hayward Fault, uh, which is related to the size of the earthquake, the magnitude, uh, caused ground shaking in this area of intensity nine. And that's related to the size of, you know, the, size of the earthquake, magnitude seven, but it's also related to the local uh, geology and soil conditions. So you can have a, an earthquake with a smaller or larger magnitude and still have intensity nine. So intensity nine is related to ground shaking. One way to understand these colors is if I told you that intensity nine is almost one G of acceleration. So the question becomes, what's a G of acceleration? Well, Ken's gonna show us. So the video showed a magnitude seven, which is like John, Sean said, um, intensity nine or 10, which is a ground movement. So it's about the force that gravity is exerting, keeping you on the earth. So we can get a sense for that feel of what that force is like. Um, we can accelerate ourselves up into the air by a jump. And when you land, that's about the intensity nine or 10, which is the ground movement. So I want you guys to experience this just a little bit. Only if you're able, you have room. Feel free to stand up on your feet. And we're all gonna do a, a little intensity nine or 10 on the scale. All right. I'm going to count to three. On three, everybody does a little leap into the air. That's the acceleration. When you land, that's what's equivalent to the intensity nine or 10. One, two, three. All right. All right. However, no, don't sit oh, down oh, yet. Oh. An earthquake doesn't last for one jump. Let's, let's try this for five seconds, repeatedly jumping for five seconds. And Ken, before you start. Again, only if you have the space and, and are able to. And Ken, before you start, I'll invite the uh, online audience to jump along with us at home. Absolutely. So, <laughs> we'll feel you. So again, I'll, I'll count to three, we'll start jumping, and I'll count down five seconds, and then we'll stop. Are you ready? Yeah. Excellent. One, two, three, four, Three, two, one, stop. Thank you. Now, that jumping, we, we jump every day. It's hard to get a picture, but remember an earthquake could last up to 20 or 30 seconds. You jumped for five. What if, what if you were doing that same leap for 20 or 30 seconds? But you got, also remember, what about your house? Imagine your house making that same leap for 20 or 30 seconds. Then you can start to get the kind of idea that intensity nine or 10 ground movement would cause and damage. All right, Sean? thanks. So, um, so one way seismologists understand the movement of the earth, the movement of the earth caused by jumping, um, is with a seismogram. And so the bottom here, the bottom axis here is time. The uh, horizontal axis is acceleration, so we're talking about G's of acceleration there, I think, and the top panel is the vertical axis. So when the Earth moves, we can see uh, the acceleration caused by it. Now, we saw one jump that you guys did, which is about a G. You see that in the top panel in the vertical. But as Ken said, it's not just one jump, it's many over a certain amount of time. And it's not just up and down, it's also side to side. So you can see these are the types of accelerations 
that we expect to see. Okay, we've got to be safe there. So this is um, a seismogram that would have been, similar to what I showed you, that would have been recorded here at the bank head from that scenario earthquake that I showed you, the movie that I showed you in the beginning. This is the, this is the motion that you would see. You can see that we almost reach the acceleration you produced while jumping. But there's a lot more jumping going on. And it lasts for almost a minute, not just 10 seconds or whatever we did there, but lasts for almost a minute. So you have to think about that. One way to compare this is to look at, compared to another earthquake. Uh, for example, in 1980, there was an earthquake right near here, uh, magnitude 5.5, uh, that, that actually caused damage at the Livermore Lab. Now you may think 5.5. That's not that much different. That's only one and a half different than the magnitude seven that you just showed me in the movie, Sean. Well, here's the seismogram from that earthquake. And you can see much smaller amplitude. And uh, we'll talk more about that. You can see much smaller amplitude and, um, um, and a much shorter duration of shaking. So what you can, uh, in fact, one thing you can learn from this is that one magnitude unit it's not just one unit, but it's also a 30 times difference in energy. So let me show you something else that may bring it home. This is uh, footage from an earthquake in Japan. Uh, and this is the same magnitude that we would expect on the Hayward Fault. <laughs> I guess. Did you guys see that, uh, that guy in the, on the bottom right there? That's one more time, just to scare everyone the most. <laughs> this guy right here. This. So this is, this is the type of motion, this is the type of damage that you need to think about and that you need to prepare for. So let's look at that movie one more time. And now that we kind of really know what red means, we really know what intensity means, we can think of the red area as the shaking I gave this computer and knocked everything out, or the shaking that you saw in Japan. So as you watch this movie, think about what you would do in this situation and think about what the ground motion looks like to you. All right, so I'm gonna ask a question. Before I ask the question, I wanna make a note that this is work done by the US Geological Survey again. Impressive work. So as you watch that, what did the ground motion remind you of? I'm gonna ask the question. Anyone wanna give an observation? Scientist, the way we first start with science, we have observations. Give me an observation, yes sir. Yes sir. Oh, it looks like water. I completely agree, you definitely deserve this. Oh, you got it? Okay, well, see, I'll just transfer the slinky right there. That's how good I am. Um, I completely agree. And in fact, it's remarkable how much it looks like that. Well, so I agree, it looks like water, water waves. Ken's gonna give us a little bit of an intro uh, in a, into a demo of how, of waves. So waves are particular things. They're oscillation through space and time with the transfer of energy. So one of the ways we can model that is with a, a slinky. So with a slinky, we can create a wave 
and you can see that the wave has these crests and valleys. A wavelength is defined as the distance from one crest to the next as it moves. The amplitude is how big the wave is from the center line. So from the center line, how much up or down does it go? If I increase the energy, I can have a bigger amplitude. I can also increase the energy and have a shorter wavelength. So bigger amplitude or shorter wavelength increases the amount of energy. Because of the regularity, you can see that that's something that can be described mathematically. Once again, this is, this is what's called a shear wave. We'll talk about that later, a little bit more. We can also create something called a compressional wave where the movement is in the direction of the energy flow. So again, this is something scientists can use. They can describe this mathematically from these types of models. Sean? Awesome. So as Ken said, you can, we can use math to describe this type of motion. Um, this is a differential equation. You'll learn about this in uh, calculus. But uh, the U is displacement. And it's, it's showing displacement as a function of space x and time t. Now this equation has a simple, this 1D equation has a simple solution. It's a sine, it's a uh, sine wave. I'm sorry, I should have shown that earlier. So this is the differential equation up there on the top. The solution to this, the solution for u for displacement, is a sine wave. Um, you'll learn about sine wave. Sine wave is a trigonometric function. You can learn about that in uh, pre-calculus. But you can see the sine wave is like this. And what does it look like? Well, it looks like the slinky, but it also looks like the seismogram that I showed you. This is the one from 1980 from Livermore. It has similar character. So we can use this simple equation, the sim simple differential equation that I showed with a simple solution of a sine wave to describe slinkies, uh, water waves, as you mentioned earlier, and also motion in the Earth. Now, it's a simple equation, but we have to, because in order to keep track of all the variables of geology and, and soil type and all that, we have to put that simple equation into a large computer to keep track of everything and to make that movie that I showed earlier. Now, so now maybe we understand a little bit about what an earthquake is, but now let's learn about why we have earthquakes. And Ken's gonna give us the big picture here. So I, I'm just curious, um, shout out if you know what this supercontinent was called. Excellent, oh. Pangaea. Pangaea is about uh, 200 million years ago. Forces within the mantle that create new crust are what move these continents around. Can we go for it? Go ahead. Okay. So you can see those forces shift the continents from where they were 200 million years ago until they come to the location that they are today. These forces then will continue to work into the future. They'll continue to shift the continents to new locations in the future. Let's look specifically at California, though. That's what we're interested in. That's where we are. Here's a representation or a animation that's going to show that the blue is the ocean, Pacific Ocean plate. The tan would be the North American plate. The zigzag line through the ocean is a mid-ocean ridge. This is a place where mantle comes up from, or magma comes up from the mantle and forms new ocean crust. The straight line along the continent is called the subduction zone. That's a place where the old ocean crust goes underneath, back into the mantle, and destroyed. So as we progress from 40 million years to present, you can see that crust is being destroyed faster than it's being created at the mid-ocean ridge. So the mid-ocean ridge migrates towards the continent, changing the direction of plate motion. So instead of going underneath, it changes it to what we know as a transform fault where the two plates are sliding past each other. As they're sliding past each other, these are what's creating the earthquakes that we experience here in California. It's also bringing Los Angeles closer to San Francisco, so get ready for that in about <laughs> 10,000 years. 
So you can think of this then, as Ken said, as the fault line. You can see the fault line there. Think of that as the San Andreas Fault or the San Andreas Fault system with the Hayward Fault. And on, on either block on that is uh, one of the two plates, the North American plate or the Pacific plate. And you can see that over millions of years, these plates are moving past one another, inches per year. But then in an instant, the stress builds up, bam, and we have an earthquake. And so that's kind of how that occurs. Now, this is the theory of elastic rebound. So we, that's the theory that we call it. Uh, scientists use simple models to test these kinds of theories. Um, one such model Ken has set up for us uh, to describe for us. Thank you. All right. We have here a model that's going to show a little bit. Just go ahead and wait right there. Thanks. So the, the block represents the rock, and I have grip tape, which represents the rock. The fault is where the two slide across or from each other. I have here a scale that will measure the force that we're exerting. Now those plate tectonic forces that you saw moving the continents around are constantly moving. As those move, the rock doesn't move because it has friction built up. The friction is keeping them in place. If I apply a little force, and we can see that the band is taut, there's definitely force applied, but again, the rock isn't moving. The earthquake is what occurs when the force from the tectonic movement, the stress builds up, overcomes the force of friction holding the rock together. Hmm. So that was your earthquake that occurred. One of the things that scientists look at is we have a model like this, we should be able to predict when earthquakes can happen. We can see what force is needed to overcome. But we come up with a, another problem that it presents, if you could. All right, audience participation. Zach is one of my star students here. He's going to make marks on this tape, the front of the block, every time the block moves. And we'll see, and I will apply force at a regular interval. So we'll see how often that that occurs. Thank you. All right. So if we look at the marks that Zach made here, you can see we have nine and a half centimeters, followed by four centimeters, followed by seven and a half, followed by four and a half. They are not regular. Mm. They do fall within a range, but because they're not regular, we didn't change the block, we didn't change the grip tape, we applied regular steady force, yet the earthquake did not occur at a regular amount or an interval. This is what causes scientists some problems with trying to predict earthquakes. That's right. So that's very interesting. So, so as Ken showed, you get a range of recurrence times. Um, scientists combine that range of recurrence times with the size of the fault that they're interested in studying. Once you know the size of the fault, you know that the, the approximate magnitude that that fault uh, could, uh, of an earthquake that that fault could produce. You combine those two and you can come up with a probability for earthquake occurrence in the future. And that's what the folks at the USGS have done. And they've calculated it for all the faults in the Bay Area. And they have found that in the Bay Area, there is a 63% chance of a magnitude 6.7 or larger earthquake. <laughs> that's a question on their worksheet, Sean. That's, that's, what, that's, what that's what I'm getting here. That's what I'm getting here. Uh, 63% chance or larger of a magnitude 6.7 or larger, I'm sorry, 63% chance of a 6.7 or larger in the next 30 years. Question is, sometimes people will ask, why, why do they use the time interval of 30 years? Um, it, was, it was a choice based purely on the fact that they felt people could understand 30 years because often mortgages are paid out in 30 years. That's something for your parents to maybe understand a little more than you do. Um, 
But the, we can see that uh, from this map that the Hayward Fault, which is the scenario earthquake I showed you, is the most hazardous, has a 31% chance. Um, but there are other faults, there are other faults uh, involved as well. The uh, Calaveras Fault, which runs through Pleasanton, um, and then there's also the Greenville Fault, which runs right through here, which has a 3% chance. Now, 63% chance, that's about a two in three. Yeah. But it's not 100%. However, as, uh, as Ken uh, once asked me, if the weatherman says 60% chance of rain, do you bring an umbrella? I do. You know? Oh, and there he is. <laughs> He's got his umbrella. <laughs> that does. All right. So we've done a lot, um, scientists have done a lot of work to understand earthquakes. But I use this science every day at work to study something else. something else is nuclear explosions. So just like earthquakes, explosions can produce ground motion. Here's a simple movie where the explosion is at the center, and you'll see in color, similar to the intensity I showed uh, for the earthquake, you'll see the, gr the ground motion move out. We're going to look at the first circle that moves out. Very simple, but I just wanted to show that there's simple, similar ground motion. That first circle right there is the P wave. We mentioned it a couple times. It's called the compressional or primary. Ken showed you on the slinky the sense of motion, but here's another way to think about the sense of motion. Now, this is a very efficient way to transfer energy in the Earth. Uh, Ken has maybe some volunteers to show us how, how uh, efficient this way, this way is, this is at transferring energy. So I've asked some of my students to join me here, if you can line up with your hands on top. On top of the shoulder. So with a P wave, there's compressional forces. Energy moves through, but you don't actually move the substance of the rock. So if I were to apply energy to the back of this line here, the energy would move through even though the students don't change their location. Now, you have to understand this is kind of special for me. I don't get to shove students around very much. <laughs> so, um, but it, we'll apply the energy here and we'll see if the person on the end then can feel that energy. I want to see that one more time, actually. Oh, I, want to see, I want can, to see one more time. I, can I shove them like five more times? Uh, well, I mean, let's just, oh, okay. I want to see how, how okay, this works. Okay, just once. Oh, that's pretty cool. So you can see the energy is transferred through, even the students haven't changed their location. Thank you very much. All right, let's give them a hand. So these P waves are very efficient, transferring energy. This is a movie where you have a cutout of the, uh, the Earth. You can see the core in the center and then the surface on the outside. The explosion will take place at the top on the surface. And the yellow is the P wave. The yellow travels through the mantle, different layers of the interior of the Earth. But as it does that, it touches all parts, pretty much all parts of the surface of the Earth. That's what you can kind of see in this pretty trippy movie. Um, but there is a, uh, so this, it touches all parts of the surface of the Earth. And what, we, what seismologists have uh, all over the Earth it then is seismic stations. So each one of these, this is a, the, each black dot and red star is a seismic station. And in each seismic station, we have seismometers. Okay. Okay. Here's a, an example of a seismometer. I think I can lift it. Um, and these are very sensitive instruments to measure the displacement of the Earth. So just like when I say displacement, just like that last student was pushed off from the original push from the, from the first student. You could think of the first student maybe as the explosion, transferring energy with a P wave through the earth, which is the rest of the students, and then ending at the last student, which would maybe be the surface. We have a seismometer on that student. 
when that seismometer moves, it senses that displacement. Now these seismometers are so sensitive that sometimes they could, that some of them are able to measure um, displacements the width of the human hair. And that's the kind of thing that we need to measure uh, smaller explosions as well. Now the P wave isn't the only uh, wave that is formed. There's also an S wave or a shear wave. Here's the motion uh, from that wave. Not as efficient, but still uh, generated in, a, in a, an earthquake. So an earthquake, let's see here. So an earthquake is efficient at generating that shear wave as well, because the shear wave is formed by a shearing motion. And so just like I showed that elastic rebound movie, you have your fault, and then once the earthquake occurs, both blocks move, bam, as I like to say, bam, and then you have this shearing motion across the fault. This shearing motion creates these, these S waves that I showed you here. And so in an earthquake seismogram, you'll see both a P wave and an S wave. Now an explosion on the other hand, an explosion on the other hand is mostly just a compressional pulse on a sphere, so it's just boom, radiating out. There's not much of this kind of motion going on. So an explosion is not as efficient at producing uh, S waves as, say, an earthquake. So for example, here's another seismogram from an explosion. You see the P wave energy, but you don't really see the S wave energy. And this is the kind of information that scientists at Livermore Lab use to detect or discriminate or tell the difference between explosions and earthquakes. In fact, this top seismogram right here is from the declared uh, nuclear test in North Korea in 2006. And this was the kind of information we used to, to know that it was an explosion. Now, you don't have to be a seismologist at Livermore Lab studying uh, explosions to be, to be in seismology. Here's just a few careers that I listed that are part of, that are, use seismology or geophysics. Um, uh, most often they're employed in the oil uh, field as well. But I think we have time now for a few questions. And maybe we'll start out with some Twitter questions, some tweets from my Twitter followers. Sean? Yes. Here you go. Here's your first oh, okay, question. Excellent. Do you think we are prepared for a massive earthquake on the Hayward Fault? Well, maybe I'll ask you guys that. So who wants to answer? Because, I, you know, I'm a seismologist, so I, I, I see this stuff every day, and I'm freaked out, and my wife will tell you that we are prepared. Um, <laughs> but I'm, I'm actually very curious about how people here in Livermore that maybe don't know about the, the uh, hazard from the Hayward Fault, how, uh, how they're prepared. Anyone have a story about how they're unprepared or, or are prepared? I'd be curious to see how many people, how about this, we'll do this. How many people here know that they have a stash of food and clothes and other uh, equipment, hazard equipment, in their, in their home right now? Okay, maybe, what do you think? You're probably better at this. What is this, 25% or something like that? About 25%. Okay, yeah. So a quarter. Well, first of all, you guys are great. You guys all get my gold star for the day. So I think that's the real answer, you know, is that... Even, even for people that live here in the East Bay, which is earthquake country, 75% uh, are unprepared for the next Hayward earthquake, which has a what percent chance? All right. Let me ask another one here. There's, there's two questions that are related to each other. Uh, one person asked, do earthquakes relieve pressure on the fault um, or cause more pressure? And the second question that was asked was, do they cause pressure on other parts of the fault? Oh, excellent So question. do they relieve pressure or do yeah. they increase pressure? Yes, okay, this is, a, this is a great question. So what will happen is, um, and before I forget, I should have put this up while we were talking about that last question. Um, hold on one second on that. The, um, if you do wanna, if for the 75% that did not raise their hand, a great place to start to uh, arm yourself with information and also be able to uh, prepare your kid at home is this website right here, uh, 72hours.org. So I'm gonna put a plug in for that right now. Okay, but now onto the question. Um, so the question was, do earthquakes A, relieve, I'm gonna say pressure stress on a fault, um, or do they put more, and then does it actually uh, transmit to other faults? This is a very good question. This is a, this is a field of active study for seismologists right now. Um, so, when, so when an earthquake occurs, 
you have sliding on the fault. It relieves the immediate uh, stress that's in that fault region. I'll, I'll answer to you, I guess, <laughs> in that fault region. But what we found is that at the corners of the fault, you have um, some complications due to this that then sort of restress other areas in the immediate region. And based on the size of that earthquake, you, that's the uh, size of maybe I'll say the uh, effective window or effective shadow that this uh, stress can be put. If there is another fault in this shadow or region on these corners, which is often the case in the Bay Area, I showed you that map of all the, uh, all the faults of the San Andreas fault system. So if you have one, often another fault will be in that shadow, I guess you could say, or area, area of influence. Um, when it's in that area of influence, it is, the fault is then re-stressed either in a favorable or unfavorable uh, method depending on what the earthquake was. And yes, it could um, increase the hazard, uh, increase the probability of having another earthquake. But Excellent. that's something that's active study and uh, something we're trying to understand more about. So one more question and then we'll take some from here. Uh, the last one somebody put down here, why are some faults more active than others? Mm. Well, so I guess this is, for, there's, maybe there's two answers for this. Um, one is you showed the, uh, the map of Pangea breaking up, you know, breaking up and all the faults. So each of those plate boundaries and plates are moving at different rates relative to each other. So one can imagine if you have two plates, one moving uh, at a faster rate, so the rate similar to what uh, Ken was showing here with this uh, motion, or I don't know what we want to call this, the, uh, the pulley system. The pulley system. The pulley system, so it would be going at a greater rate. We would then expect to have uh, more, more slips of the, of the brick, in other words, more earthquakes. Um, the, second part answer to that the second part of the answer to that question is a little more complicated as, one could, as, it, 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 as it always is uh, in science. And, that's, and that has uh, something to do with, uh, Ken showed this, um, you know, you have the sandpaper here to rep represent friction on the fault. Well, for a fault, it is not all one uniform layer of sandpaper or one uniform layer of friction. There can be differing amounts of friction on different parts of the fault. Oh. And, what, uh, <laughs> and what scientists are finding is that um, at, if you have an earthquake on one part of the fault or a different part of the fault, it's really a function of what type of friction um, is occurring at that fault as well. Good. Okay, well that's the uh, tweak questions. Anyone have questions from here? We're gonna start on this side with the ushers with the microphones. Um, Yes, sir, do you have? Or we can start on the left side, I don't, I, either way. If an earthquake widens a fault, how much would it? One more time, sorry. How much would an earthquake widen the fault? Hmm, okay, so oftentimes, especially in uh, disaster movies that you see these days, is an earthquake will occur and there'll be a large chasm that opens up and swallows some building or something like that. And that's kind of a myth that has been perpetuated by people that don't necessarily understand the, the seismology, but you guys are all seismologists now, and you know that when a, for a, the San Andreas Fault System, because, uh, because the fault is occurring like this, all it is doing is really sliding past each other. It doesn't necessarily open up. It's a different type of motion that does that. So all it does is slide past. And in fact, one of the things that most uh, impresses me about earthquakes in the earth is that this, this fault right here, this little line right here, really is a very narrow line. And some, especially for parts of the San Andreas Fault System, you can measure this, this fault in inches and feet in some places. So it's really just a narrow area. And some places you can, you can, cover, you can stand over one foot on the, Pacific plate, on the Pacific plate, one foot on the North American plate, and just that little fault zone is right underneath you. And so when that slips, they just, they just slide right past each other and they don't open up. Sometimes you'll see that in old um, stories, there'll be stories from farmers saying that there was an earthquake and it swallowed my cow. That's one of the famous ones from an old Hayward, uh, Hayward uh, earthquake. But what that happens is just because of the soil on the surface, it'll maybe break up and so maybe there'll be a little, little holes that are formed, little chasms, but never anything that sort of opens up into the deeper layers of the earth. But thanks for that question. Yes, sir. Yes. I know it's a scary thought. 
I know. So it would, it would just, in fact, I, I, maybe we'll, can we show the movie again? Because this is a very interesting question. So let's see if I can get fast enough here. I don't want to uh, slow us down, but oh, I know what I can do. So we'll see the movie again. I know we went quickly through a lot of this. So you can see the subduction zone is going into California, like this, like Ken said, then transfers to a transform fault system, which slides past each other like this. And so if you focus just on that last part of the movie, did you see that last part of the movie? You can imagine that same sliver is gonna just con keep continue going north in this movie. So there's nothing really that, uh, I'll play it one more time. So this is again the subduction, but the thing, that you're, the, the thing that will answer your question directly is once California turns from a subduction to a transform right about here, and you can see that little sliver in the south moving up to where we are now. Now the great thing about this plate tectonics is that we can also make some predictions. Ken talked about the position. So you can just imagine that sliver just keep on going north. Does that make sense? Okay, excellent. The important part of that question is recorded because there have been large earthquakes that have been going on since breakup. Um, but the largest one ever recorded is, was in Chile in 1960. Um, I think it was a 9.5 or 9.6, which is very large. In uh, subduction zones, you can get much larger earthquakes because the, the plate is moving down below the other one. And really what, what determines the magnitude of the Earthquake is the amount of fault that slips, the amount of area that slips. That's one of the ways people look at to try to understand probabilities. That's why we, that's why we can say um, that the maximum earthquake on the Hayward Fault is maybe a seven or a six, six nine. In fact, let me take this moment to, uh, to say that the movie that I showed you really is a worst case scenario. So I wanna make that comment. Um, my goal was to scare you guys. I hope I did that. Um, so it's really a, a worst case scenario. And what I want to say is that there are, there are a couple things in this worst case scenario. One is that we think that the uh, Hayward Fault is, we know the Hayward Fault is here. But one uh, assumption that we're making, something in science that you always have to ask about is, what kind of assumptions is the scientist making? One assumption in, the, in this scenario is that the fault continues up through here and then continues into San Pablo Bay. So there's a, there is some evidence to show that perhaps this, the fault, this Hayward fault right here ends here and there is another segment that continues up into San Pablo Bay. If these, if these two faults are segmented, then the, then the only part that can slip on the fault is from here to here. And since that's a smaller amount of fault, the, uh, it's a smaller magnitude. The, um, but in this case, we, we said, okay, it's a larger fault, so it's gonna go all the way up through here. And then the next assumption is that we say, the assumption that made it worse for us here in Livermore is that the earthquake started up here. If we started here, which is from the previous epicenter in Hayward, or if we started here, which is another possible hypothesis, um, it would be less ground shaking in this, uh, in Livermore region right here. So that's how you get those magnitudes. Um, but just like the 9.6 in Chile, maybe you uh, remember from the news, uh, the, J uh, the Japan earthquake that then damaged the nuclear power plant as well. That was also a subduction zone earthquake. And that's why that was a large one as well. Uh, 
So I think I'll, I'll end with that question there. Sean? And I guess, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. We're going to oh. one, one more okay. tweet question, and then we'll... Excellent. Okay. And I, I think this one I might actually be able to answer here. Okay, great. The student, the, the student person asked, does a P wave or an S wave cause more damage? Hmm. Um, we haven't told you about all the waves that are created when an earthquake happens. The P wave was the compressional wave. And although it does definitely moves the ground, an S wave moving up and down also would um, cause damage. But behind both of those are surface waves. Surface waves are called Love and Raleigh waves. Surface waves move in different directions all at the same time. If you can imagine the up and down motion and plus a back and forth at once is what a Love wave would be causing. So because those surface waves which come after the PNS waves are moving ground in multiple directions, that's gonna end up causing more damage to buildings and structures. Absolutely, that's a very good point. All right, well, that's all the time we have for questions right now. I'll, I'll be up here if you guys wanna come up and ask some more questions. On behalf of, of Ken and Robin, I wanna say I hope you learned a lot today about seismology and earthquakes and earth explosions. Thank you very much.